Bethesda House of Mercy. Look at that. Bunch of joyful people in the house of the Lord. Well, uh, stand and worship with us. We invite you to worship with us. And uh, there's a lot of things that we can taste and see um, uh, naturally and in, in, our, in our weeks, in our months, in our, in our lives. But the best thing that we could ever taste and see is his goodness, Jesus' goodness and faithfulness and his love. And so that's what we're going to sing about this morning is the goodness of God. Amen. The Lord is good. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good to me. You turn my morning into dancing. Put off my rags and clothe me with gladness, and I will rise and I will praise you. I'll sing and not be silent. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good to me. You turn my morning into dancing. Put off my rags and clothe me with gladness. And I will rise and I will praise you. I'll sing. Be silent, O oh Lord, my God. I will give thanks to you forever, O oh Lord, my God. I will give thanks to you. We bless you, O oh Lord, my God. I will give thanks to you forever, O oh Lord. the Lord, he is good. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good to me. You turn my morning into dancing, put off my rags and clothe me with gladness and I will rise and I will praise you. I'll sing.
majesty. Let all the earth rejoice, all the earth rejoice. He wraps himself in light, and darkness tries to hide, and trembles at his voice. Trembles at his voice. How great is our God? Sing with me. How great is our God? And oh, see how great, how great is our God. I want to sing that again. Trembles at his voice, and trembles at his voice. How great is our God? Sing with me. How great is our God? And all oh, will see how great, how great is our God. Beginning and the end, beginning and the end. 
Come on now, church. Lift up the Lord this morning. Continue. Continue to sing His praise this morning. Amen. Continue to see His praise this morning. He is so good. He is faithful. He is faithful. God is faithful. We're going to worship Him in giving this morning as we usually do, a part of our worship. Amen? Amen. 2 Corinthians 9 says, Each one of us must decide in our hearts what to give according to how God has blessed you, but don't give reluctantly or under pressure. We never pressure that. We never beg or ask you or you know, put you under pressure to give because it needs to come from your heart. We're going to bring in the tithes out of obedience to the Lord, but we want to offer up an offering to Him too, sowing into the kingdom of God. Amen. As most of you know, you were here all week and all the lives that were touched and changed. But there's many more. There's many more that I believe God's opening up a door for us. He's faithful and His promises are true. Those words that are spoken over us will come to pass. They will come to pass. Uh, Bethesda is so blessed. And Father, we just thank You this morning for Your goodness. Lord, we could sing all day long about how good you are to us. And I pray that each one in this uh, gathering this morning feels that, how blessed they are, knowing that God loves them. He loves them. Father, we offer up this offering this morning for the advancement of your kingdom. God, we ask your blessings on it. The people of Bethesda are so so uh, eager to give, eager to give. God, we experience that over and over and over. And we just give you thanks and praise this morning, God. We pray your blessings on each one, upon every business in this church and those businesses that are going to walk through the doors. We pray your blessings, God. Multiply that. Give health, prosperity in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I, I would like to go ahead, ushers, and wait on the church. Just say thank you to those that give to the food pantry. You probably saw in the bulletin, it's, it's stocked. Praise the Lord. It's stocked and running over. Uh, it's running over. So if there's a need, we want to minister to that need. If you know someone, if you have a neighbor, or if someone walks through these doors and and they say something that they have a need for food, don't let them leave till they get cared for. Uh, the Lord has been a blessing in that area. Tomorrow evening at 5.30, for those that would like to serve, uh, Feeding America. Uh, it slipped up on me to get Sister Heather to put it in the bulletin, but 5.30 at, at Feeding America. God bless you. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Lord is worthy, is he not? Praise the Lord, he's good. Amen. Outside on the table, there's a sign-up sheet. We have about 30 people signed up for the seminar coming up with Jason King the first weekend of May. You do not want to miss that. It's talking about um, the tabernacle. It's talking about the kingdom of God, which we have been discussing and praying about. It's going to be a very interesting time, and so you don't want to miss that. So sign up so we can get the right number. They're making all the materials there and bringing it, so I have to get the numbers to them as soon as possible. Do not miss out. How many of you are wanting to go deeper? How many of you don't want to stop? 
I want to press in. Praise the Lord. Let's continue to do that. Tonight, tonight at um, 5 o'clock, we'll be having a talent time. I don't like calling it a contest. It's not a talent contest. Nobody's competing against anybody else. And we don't want it to be a show. Hello? We want the Holy Spirit, even though we're going to have fun in this, we want the Holy Spirit to have a hold of this. Amen? So let's all come out to that tonight. If you have a talent, you should sign up and uh, let your talent be seen by those that are around you. Amen? Amen. Let's all stand and, and let's go around and meet and greet and let everybody know you're glad they're here.
Jesus Christ's holy name. And anything that would attempt to exalt itself above the name of Jesus Christ is gone. It is done away with. It is brought down. It is thrown down in Jesus' name. It is broken. And in the powerful name of our risen Savior, we come in. We come in. Jesus. Jesus.
Come on, church, let's praise the Lord. Jesus, we love you. Jesus, we love you. Come on, church, let's give God praise. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. You're worthy, Lord. You're worthy, Lord. You're worthy, Lord. God, you're worthy. You're worthy. You're worthy. You're worthy. We love you, God, with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength. Father, we give you praise. We give you glory. You are everything, Lord. I love you, I love you. Jesus, I love you, I love you, I love you. My Jesus, I love you, love you, I love you. More than anything. Oh, Lord. Let it be so God. Let it be so God. Let it be so, God. Lord, we want this to be more than words. More than a song. But God, we want it to be a lifestyle. A lifestyle in which our lives exhibit the fact that we love you more than anything. Lord, that our fruit backs up what we say with our lips because, Lord, we don't want to hear you say that you praise me with your lips, but your heart's far from me. Lord, help us to realize what we are in right now. What it is that we face moment to moment. But more than the realization, God, of what it is that we face. Let us, without wavering, understand that greater is he that is in us than he that's in the world. Let us realize, God, no weapon formed against us can prosper. Father, let us proclaim that the Lord is our light and our salvation. Whom do we have to be afraid of? You are the strength of our life, O God. And even though the enemy has a scheme and a plan, when he comes up against us, he stumbles and falls. For you, O Lord, have set us up upon a rock. You have established us, God. And we know, Lord, that he has no power against us, only what we let him have. Only what we give up. And so we stand here this morning, Lord, overwhelmed by your presence and your love. Knowing, God, that you have given to us the victory. And we refuse to bow down this morning to the plan of the enemy. He may roar, but he has no authority. And we take authority over him today in the name of Jesus over every life, over every person in here, where the enemy is whispering in their ear lies. Trying to convince them that victory is not theirs. Because he will say to you, 
well, you've prayed before, well, you believed before, you said there was results before, you said you healed me before, you said you saved me before, you said I believed before. And the enemy says, you will fail again. Even since Thursday night, some of us have had the enemy come in like a flood. With his lies and his deceit. Amen? His symptoms. How many of you know symptoms are only a device to cover over a greater issue? God can take care of the issue and the enemy still bring around symptoms. Because he wants you with your mouth to embrace the symptom. He wants to bring about a symptom so that you forget about your identity in Christ. And he wants you then to speak about, oh yeah, right there, that's who I really am. But everybody in here today should confess with your mouth and believe in your heart the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. Did you hear me? The Holy Spirit is touching people's lives and God says that the Holy Spirit's drawing you because that's the only way we can come to the Father. Can't come to the Father by works, can't come to the Father by religion, you can't come to the Father by lineage, you can't come by, to the Father by how long you've been around. You can only come to the Father when the Holy Spirit draws you. And if the Holy Spirit's drawing you or has drawn you in the past, then right now, confess with your mouth. Confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and believe in your heart that He is your Lord. And He will save you. Let's see, what did I say? I said, right now. Don't be backward. Right now, this minute, in unison, let's confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus Christ. As a corporate body, let's confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, you are king. Lord, you're the Lord of lords. You are everything. You're everything, God. We surrender to you. We yield to you and the calling of the Holy Spirit. And Father, we thank you that we have walked through the door. Jesus being the door. And we are now in your presence, God. Not only do we confess that with our mouth. But in unison today, we believe that in our heart. It's not just a religious statement. I'm saved, but I'm being saved. Huh? I want to be more saved next month than I am today. Some mornings I don't feel all that saved. Huh? Some mornings I don't feel all that victory. Some morning I don't feel all that peace. But I still declare it. When the enemy comes and says, ah, you're not even saved. I say, I'm saved. I'm saved. I've been washed in the blood of the Lamb. I've been delivered. He said, you don't have peace I say the peace that the Lord gave me is not of this world. I have a peace 
that's not affected by my circumstances. I have a peace that's not affected by people. I have a peace that only God can give. When he brings a lie, we smack him back with the truth. Amen? This morning, I want us to break, have a breaking of the enemy's assignments. We had a little bit of this, talked a little bit of this about revival, but... I believe there's more of this that needs to happen this morning. Because listen, we want to break off everything that's not like God. From off of our lives, any effect. We want want every spirit that's not like Jesus Christ to be cast off of us. We, we know that the reason why there are assignments of the enemy against us is because we have an assignment from God. Huh? Does everybody know in here? Everybody. Go like this. Everybody. Me, 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 me. Has a destiny. A calling. Something God is trying to move you to. And so the enemy, he knows because he hears us, he sees us, he hears words spoken over us. Then he brings an assignment against you to do what? To stop that. And listen, a lot of times it's a subtle word. Did you hear me? It's a subtle work. It's not like blatant all the time or it doesn't overwhelm you necessarily all the time. Sometimes it's subtle. The Bible says that the serpent was more subtle than every beast of the field. That's why he could sit there in his little slickster ways and he could smooth talk Eve into doing what God had told them not to. How many of you have had the enemy slick talk you into doing what you knew God did not want you to do? We know it's the truth. Because Paul said, the things that I go and I know to do, I don't do them. The things that I know I shouldn't do, I do them. Oh, wretched man that I am, who's going to deliver me from this body of death? Well, I'm going to tell you, we know the answer. Jesus! Jesus is the war cry. He breaks every chain. He unlocks every door. The spiritual warfare that's occurring... Right under our noses, it's both all, uh, oftentimes it's both in obvious but also subtle ways. Sometimes we don't recognize it right at first. We fall into it a little bit. Anybody? We stumble into it. And then when we're into it, it's almost like, oh no, it's overwhelming then. Because before we realize it, man, we are in his clutches. Because we know, we know, we know that for everybody in the kingdom of God, there are two competing agendas. We know that for one because the Bible says the flesh and the spirit are contrary to one another. There is a warfare against the flesh and the spirit. These two are contrary. They can't stand each other. And the conflict or the war is for the soul of man. It's for your consciousness. It's for your character. It's for everything that makes you who you are. These two opposing forces are out to try to capture, to gain hold of, or to gain a a stronghold on the soul. It's like death versus life. 
The one brings death. The Bible said that the covenant of Ishmael was a covenant of death. It was the covenant of flesh. There's no life in it. There's no victory in it. And the Bible says, but the covenant of of Isaac, the covenant that he had, it was a covenant of life. And, And the scripture teaches us in Galatians that these two, death and life, can't dwell in the same house. You have to cast out the bondwoman and her son. And you have to embrace the promise. You have to focus in on the promise. God has a plan for every man, woman, child in this place. This plan, if it was contained in one word, would be he has life. Do you understand that? I speak life over every person in here today. I prophesy life over every person in here today. I curse the sentence of death. Talking about spiritual. Somebody said, I don't want to die physically. You know, I used to, I, I, I used to say to people when they would say to me, I say, how you doing They say, well, I'm hanging in there. I used to say to them, well, I guess that's better than not hanging. But that's not true. Because if I'm not hanging in this life, I'm with him. Which is a far better exceeding glory. Come on. Because I'm going to tell you something. When you have Jesus Christ in here, the Bible says you are going to live for eternity. Satan has an agenda as well. His agenda is summed up in one word too. It's called uh, death. He has a plan. He has a scheme against every one of us. These agendas are directly opposed to one another. The problem is, the challenge is, to try to make sure that we recognize his subtle ways that he comes against us and the agenda that he has for our lives. He deceives, he lies, he corrupts, he brings shame, and then he dangles temptations to you and me to do things that will kill our relationships first and foremost with God. Sin separates. Do you know that when we sin, we have separated ourselves from God? Come on. You say, well, now wait a minute. You told me that if I'm saved, I'm saved. And God doesn't throw me under a bus. No, no, no. It's not that God throws us under a bus or we're no longer his child or we're no longer his sons and daughters. It's just that when we sin, sin separates us from fellowship and communion With the Father. Come on. There are consequences to sin. The greater consequence of a lifestyle of sin is to have not been born again and lose out and spend eternity in hell. But the consequence to the child of God that has given their life to Jesus when we have anxiety overrunning us, when we have fear overrunning us, when we have doubt overrunning us, when we have a lifestyle that's overrunning us and not according to God's plan, then what happens is we are separated from communion in that relationship with Jesus. While we're running around doing our thing, we then start to whine and cry about, why is this all happening to me? Come on. Why is my life such a mess sometimes? Why do I have so much drama? It's because we have allowed sin in our lives. Sin brings death. Relationship with God is broken. How many of you know that uh, sometimes when our kids, they're not even behaving, we still kind of bless them? Anybody ever here, Anybody in here ever blessed your kid and said to yourself while you're doing it, they don't really deserve this. I'll tell you what, I'll tell you what they deserve. Anybody? Huh? 
Yeah. Sometimes we, we you know, should have took the Xbox away from them for two weeks, but we let them go ahead and play. Sometimes it seems like, man, you know, I'm doing all this. I know I'm away from God, but it just seems like I'm being blessed anyway. And the devil wants to come along and says, see, it doesn't matter. It's all right for you to do that. It's all right for you to go astray. It's all right for you to focus your attention on, the, on your own self. Huh? And you just got, oh man, you're going along. Everything's going along. Everything's going good. And the enemy's working behind the scenes. And you're feeling okay because, whoo! Last night, man, I had, you wouldn't believe how I had the Holy Spirit run up and down the avenue of my soul, even though all this other stuff's going on. But what we don't realize is before we know it, all of a sudden drama, all kinds of things are happening, things are falling apart, and we don't realize what's taking place as we've been cut off from our relationship with the Father. Because we're not living a life of repentance, we think it's just the way life is. And death is occurring. Joy is starting to dissipate. Things are happening that's causing us to lose our devotion to the things that we ought to. How many of you know we should be asking in everything that we do, what would Jesus do? We can make an excuse. For every reason not to do what we think we ought to do, we want to. And those excuses aren't going to stand before the Lord. We see all kinds of things in our lives every day. But we have to recognize these competing agendas and not allow them to occupy our hearts and minds. The challenge is to recognize the subtle ways of the enemy That he's trying to lead you off the path. How many of you remember, uh, well some of you aren't old enough to remember, but I remember how that TV programs and things of that nature used to be really moral and decent. Flintstones, uh, uh, Fred and um, who? Wilma never slept in the same bed. Always had twin beds. Huh? Dick Van Dyke show. Him and Laura always slept in twin beds. We know husbands and wives, for the most part. Unless your husband snores like a freight train, then you might sleep somewhere else. Our wife. But we know husbands and wives, usually, if the marriage has harmony, sleep in the same bed. Right? So we knew that was not reality, but they did that because they didn't want people or kids out here to see that scene. And then, you know, you never heard any cuss words. You didn't hear none of the potty words. You didn't hear nothing on television. Nothing. Then we got cable TV and they started pushing the limits a little bit. And now you saw a man and a woman in bed together. Maybe there wasn't anything going on, but they started getting you used to seeing a man and a woman in there, right? And then they, and then they didn't show you any nudity, but you could tell under the covers they was making out or fooling around. And then they started using potty words. I can remember the first time I heard somebody say S-H-I-T, I thought, whoa! What's television coming to? Huh? Come on, you know I'm telling you the truth. Now, holy smoke, man, it's full-blown everything. Come on. Nowadays, you can find anything you want, anywhere you want. Why? Because the enemy's subtle. He does not just do things overnight. He doesn't break in overnight. He does stuff a little bit at a time to desensitize you. Same way in the church. He desensitizes us. That's why a lot of churches moved and operated legalism. 
They're trying to combat the powers of the enemy because they understand the people don't know what it is to walk in the kingdom of God power. We haven't taught people how to have intimate relationship with Christ. We haven't taught the church how to practice God's presence. We haven't taught the church how that Jesus and the Holy Spirit aren't the end. They're the means to the end. How that we can have access to the throne of God and there we can enjoy the presence of the Lord every moment of every day. And so the churches think that they can legislate righteousness. And man, it worked as far as some things. When we used to legislate, don't go to movies. Don't go to ball games, don't go do this, don't go do that, don't wear this, don't wear that. Hello? In the church, you didn't see a lot of stuff go on. You saw people dress appropriately. You saw people talk appropriately. You saw people doing things that was considered appropriate. And then we got this enlightenment, which is truth. You can't legislate righteousness. You, you can't force somebody to do right enough to, and be right. You cannot have enough rules and regulations for people to walk by. But what happened when we took that off, and you know, people got this feeling, you know, when I was growing up in church, 18 years old and up, Man, if you didn't go to every meeting, you were a backslider. And you knew the pastor was going to come to you, not with, hey, missed you. <laughs> you wanted it to be that. <coughs> but it was, hey, you know you're not going to survive spiritually if you don't start getting into these meetings. Well, dude, I missed one night. I don't care. And you, you just wouldn't do it, man, Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. If we had a revival for two weeks, man, you was there every single night. And then we got this epiphany with us, and we realized, wait a minute, the Lord showed us, man, you can't legislate righteousness. But what we weren't thinking about, we had never taught the church how to have a relationship with Jesus so that they could discern good and evil. And so we went from one extreme to the other. Now it's, eh, who cares? It's all right. Don't matter. As long as I've got an excuse, as long as I've got a good reason, or I'm tired, or I'm not feeling the greatest. It's okay. But what we don't realize is that the devil is diabolical. He's a schemer. He wants you to think like that. He wants you to think it's not going to bother you, it's not going to hurt you. He wants you to think that you can put everything else above God, and when you get some time, it's all right. He's creative, man. He's a creative devil. When I think about the sneaky ways that the enemy has shown up in my life, it's like, wow, I didn't even see that. I didn't see that coming. We see all these things that he brings and shows up in our lives, arrogance, prejudice, stubbornness, know-it-all attitudes, independence. I don't need anybody to tell me what to do. I can do what I feel like. Or this is what I feel or sense. It's a good Pentecostal charismatic term. I feel and I see. But what we don't realize sometimes is that's the scheme of the enemy. The enemy doesn't want us to think that we need to be accountable or responsible. That's why we are living in a generation and when nobody will take responsibility for anything. Hello? It's everybody else's fault. But, thankfully, we don't have to play his game. We don't have to listen to his schemes or walk in his schemes. And we don't have to 
pay attention to his strategies other than knowing what they are. Right? God has given us everything we have need of to overcome the enemy. We are more than conquerors. Satan's strategy is destroyed through intimidation and isolation. He wants to intimidate and he wants to isolate. Most people that the devil's working on, they feel like they're alone. Did you hear me? The church could have 50 things for somebody to be involved in, but this person may feel all alone and unloved. And it's the church's fault. But we all know, don't we? We know who the real culprit is. The devil's dangling that out there, but the real problem is me, myself, and I. God's purpose is to make sure that we understand that the enemy's schemes are out against us, but that through suffering and proclamation, we can overcome. What does he say in the word of God? 1 Peter 5, 8. What does he say? Be alert and sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around seeking. He's like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. 1 Peter 5, 8. He's roaring. He's prowling. But that's all he can do is try to get you to pay attention to him. Because he can't do anything else because Jesus has already defeated him. God is the source of all good. Satan is the author of evil. The scripture says in James 1.13, when tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. So who am I being tempted by? The schemes of the enemy. The enemy's schemes. Who is it, though, that ultimately is my destruction? Me, myself, and I. We know the battle is real. Galatians 5.17 tells us that for the flesh sets its desires against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh, for those are in opposition to one another, so that you may not do the things that you please. Don't be mistaken. The picture we have of Satan isn't how he began. That's why he knows how to act. Amen? Amen. Satan's beginning was he was beautiful. He was one of the stars of heaven. He led the worship. They say, they say, theologians say that his body was nothing but instruments. Instruments of praise. He led the heavenly host in praise and glory and honor to God. He was one of the most powerful beings that God created. But what happened to him in the midst of all this, like some of us, pride set in. And he had an idea that he wanted to be God. There was a rebellion. And now we have angels that rebelled with him that are called demons. And these demons are on assignment against you. This is the tempter against which we are fighting every single day. He is bombarding us with opportunities to hurt, condemn ourselves and others. You know what what the enemy wants you to be? He wants you to be an accuser of the brethren. He wants you to be someone who gives in to his wiles. But the Bible says we're not ignorant of the wiles of the devil. We're not ignorant of his devices and schemes. And tells us that what we are to do is to resist the devil. How many know you know we're not supposed to give in? We're to resist the devil. But in order to resist the devil, we have to do what the prior verse says. We have to submit ourselves to God. How many of you want a life of victory? Huh? You want a life of peace. You want a life of joy. You want a life of 
the blessings and things of God. First and foremost, in order for you to have that, you have to submit yourself to God. You can't submit yourself to religion. You have to submit yourself to God. It's not, it's not this first. Did you hear me? You can do this and be dead. You can do this and have no life. So it's not this first. It's this first. God, you're the King of kings and the Lord of lords of my life. You're the one I'm going to surrender to. You're the one, God, that I yield my life to. And when we do that, then he says, and we seek his kingdom first... We don't like this, but it's true. We seek his kingdom first. All the other stuff comes in line. All the other stuff's good. If I'm loving him first, like I should, I'm going to love myself. A lot of people, maybe some of you in here, don't love yourself. Which tells me then you you don't love God like you should. But when we love God, we love ourselves. And when we love ourselves, we love our near ones as well when we love our near ones then we do the things that God says come on to our near ones are you listening to me we love them we care for them I can't miss if I love God and love myself I can't mistreat Sarita You say, well, you can. No, not if I'm loving God like I should. When I'm walking in the Spirit, I can't mistreat Sarita. I can't berate her. I can't abuse her. I can't speak ill. I cannot talk to her ugly. I can't treat her wrong. And when she says, man, what you said hurt my feelings, you know what the first thing I should recognize is this? I'm not loving him like I should. Or I wouldn't have hurt her. You say, well, that's kind of like being perfect. We are perfect when we're walking in the Spirit. It's when we're outside of that that the flesh gets in control. You're, a, you're, you're allowing the enemy, the one who's attacking you, death, to influence you when you are hurting and damaging your near ones. I'm going to tell you what, this is good whether you think so or not. When we damage one another, it's because we're not loving God like we should. When our lives are out of whack, whether it's no matter what it is, whether it's our attitude, mindset, work schedule, family life, it's because we're not loving God like we should. When I love God like I should, I don't neglect my children. When I love God like I should, I don't abuse my kids. When I love God like I should, I don't abuse you by running my mouth about you when you're not around. Hello? That's why Paul wrote to the Corinthians and said, I'd like to talk to you about spiritual stuff. I really would. It's more important. But I can't because you're carnal. There's strife, envy, and jealousy among you. Oh, but it's not all about the schemes of the enemy. We need to understand this. Even though he's formidable, even though he's an adversary, he's a defeated foe. He's defeated. Colossians 2.15 says, And having disarmed the powers and authorities... He, Jesus, made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. God always gives us the power to resist the schemes of the enemy. I just don't have to give in. Did you hear me? I just don't have to yield. Something happens to us. It's a legit. Anybody have legit things happen to you during the week? I mean, you're not sitting there going, 
na 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 that didn't happen. Legit things, right? Stuff. Anybody in here besides me got stuff? Somebody says something, somebody does something, tire goes flat, refrigerator blows up, washer and dryer, you got dirty clothes, you don't have anything to wear to work, and your dryer or your washer won't work. Huh? And so you're throwing something dirty into the dryer, hoping you can mask the stink from where you wore it. Oh, yeah, I know all those tricks. Put you a couple extra fluffing sheets in there. <laughs> Spray some cologne in there while it's going around. The other night I wore the uh, t-shirt that Angel made, I Am Revival. First night she brought them in and I got the bright idea, you know what, I want to wear this again. But I hadn't washed it. <laughs> and so I sprayed it with my obsession cologne and I threw it in the dryer. I can't remember who it was, but I came in wearing that. It might have been Richard. This sounds like a Richard thing. And he walks up to me. Stand up here. I don't feel like bending over. And he walks up to me, and he goes. I said, what are you doing, whoever it was? Well, you wore that last night. Oh, how do you know I didn't have two of them? Which I didn't. You wore that last night. I wanted to see if you washed it before you wore it again. <laughs> and I never said anything. Because I knew they were smelling my obsession clone. <laughs> and thinking that he probably washed it. Which I didn't. But it didn't stink. Because I made sure of it. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> we have stuff happen all the time, don't we? But how many of you know we don't have to let stuff take authority over us? We walk in sometimes looking like, man, somebody has beat us to death. There's no joy. There's no happiness. There's no peace. We look like we're beat half to death, like some semi-truck ran us over. No wonder the world's not interested in coming over here. We walk in on Monday mornings to work. Hey. You walk in and you say, hey, hey, how you doing? Yeah. Uh, morning. Dead. Or, or, or something more serious than that. We're not just tired, but man, we've had something really happen uh, in a relationship at home with our life, with our kids, with something else. Maybe we're not feeling well. We have something to take place and we're wearing it and we're living it and we're letting everybody see it. But, but because we don't have to let that happen, we don't have to yield ourselves to the powers or the things of the enemy. We can take authority. We can say, hey, devil, the assignment that you got to mess me up today, I take authority over it in Jesus' name. God always always gives us the power to resist the schemes of the enemy. Listen, if we choose, if we choose, we're made overcomers by the power that works in us. First Corinthians 10, 13 says, no temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. 
But when you are tempted, listen, when you are tested, when you are tried, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. Another Christian cuss word right there. 1 Corinthians 10, 13, endure. Words like travail until you break through. Words like endure hardships. Because they're only for a moment. (laughs) Joy comes in the morning. Good and evil are realities, not merely concepts or metaphors that we use. Jesus, in this passage of Scripture, it's Jesus and Satan face to face. Jesus was led into the spirit or the wilderness by the Spirit. The Bible says he was, as he fasted for 40 days, the devil came and tempted him. Jesus said to him, even though he came to tempt him, what did Jesus say? Away from me, Satan, for it is written, worship the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and strength. Only him serve. We are facing all these things today, and, and maybe in a week or two, a, a couple weeks, I'll finish this, but we're facing all kinds of things today, folks. But God's for us. I will use this again. I want you to scroll all the way to the very last several screens, please. In 2 Kings chapter 6, we see a couple real interesting stories here with Elisha. One of the stories, of course, is um, the story of the axe head that Pastor Tim even talked about during the revival meeting. Pastor Fred, I think, had, has used it in reference, but the axe head, you know, God cares about the small things. Amen. How many of you know it wouldn't have been that hard to go and get that replaced, but he was taking down a tree, and in the first verses there, they were cutting up some stuff and doing some work and building some places for them to dwell, and the guy borrowed an axe, and the axe head fell off. And we all know, don't we, according to, um, according to the things in life, the axe head sunk. Went to Elijah, master, the axe head was borrowed, and it fell off, and, and now it's lost. Where did you lose it? And he went back and showed him. He threw in the twig, and the axe head floated to the surface. Powerful, huh? Since we know that that shouldn't happen. God cared enough, though, because it was borrowed, and he was worried about it. He was concerned about it. Do you know God's concerned about every one of your issues? Everything the enemy tries to bring against you, no matter how big or small, God's interested in it. God cares. But see, because of the society we live in and because of the church world that we've lived in, we don't recognize that a lot of times it's the enemy at work trying to get us off track. Trying to get our focus on what we see instead of what we don't see. A little further on in this same chapter, we see Elisha, and we see the story of the Syrian king who is making war with Israel. And the Bible said he's making plans with his generals and schemes against the king of Israel, and the Bible said that every time they would go to um, implement the scheme, It was as though somebody had given the information to the king of Israel, and they weren't there. 
And so the king of Syria calls in all of his generals, and he says, hey, he said, listen, something's going on here. We've got a spy, a snitch among us. I'm paraphrasing as you read the verses. But one of them says, oh, no, king, it's not any of us. But there's this, there's this certain prophet who, in his bedchamber, he hears and goes and tells the king what the plans are. Well, we all know what was going on, don't we? Elisha was beyond the veil. Elisha wasn't just at the door, he was through the door. And he was seeing things before our, our, they happened or while they were being talked about that he had no natural ability to hear. And the king of Syria was very angry and he says, I'll tell you what, he said, get the chariots, get the horsemen, get uh, uh, all the armies and you go down and you surround the city there where he's at, Dothan. And they did. And like well-intentioned dragons, come here, Richard, since I'm talking about a well-intentioned dragon. Here he is. Here's Elisha's servant. Stay right there, brother, for a minute. Here's Elisha over here. I, I don't know. He could have been on his face. He could have been kneeling down, or he might have just been sitting there before the Lord. And, you know, he's hearing all these schemes and plans. He's through the veil. And then comes his servant running to him. Master, master! Come on, dude. Master, master! We're surrounded! The Syrians are out there surrounding us. How many of you know Elijah didn't say, hold on a second, man. I got fast and prayed for three days here. No, no, no. He was already here. He was already seeing. And he says this. Father, I pray, open up my servant's eyes so that he can go see there's more for us than against us. And the servant, Elisha's in his house. He doesn't see the army or what his servant is about to see in the natural yet. But I tell you what, he has seen it. He has seen it already. And the servant goes out, and sure enough, man, all the soldiers are there. But around them are the angels of the Lord. I'm going to tell you what, folks, the battle's not ours. We're sitting in this place this morning. I've said it before. And when I said it the last time, everybody got quiet as though, oh, no, that's how's that? Not really. There's demonic powers in this place. They wanted to, they've been speaking to you. They've been battling me the whole time we've been here at church today. They've been speaking in your ear. They've been whispering in your ear. They've been telling you this, that, and the other. While I'm speaking, they're trying to get your attention. They're, they're irritating. They're annoying. They're, they're, somebody beside you is yapping and, and, and talking to somebody, and you can't hear. Somebody's getting on their cell phone because somebody messaged you in church, which really is not that important. They're working. They're at work. But I want to tell you something else. Also in this place, the angels of the Lord are encamped round about those who love God and fear God. The power of God is here. And it's more. It's more than an angel. Moses said, God... Got to do something. These crazy people you gave me to watch over, they're driving me insane. Let me, let me tell you, this is how the enemy works. This morning,
everything under the sun you can think of has hit me as I've walked in this place. Text messages, conversations, electronics. Electronics. A PowerPoint wouldn't come up on my Surface Pro. Poor, poor, poor guys in the back. This going on, that going on. Things about the things about the talent thing tonight that I absolutely have nothing to do with and don't want to have anything to do with, planning wise. Other people has those roles, not me. Just one thing after another. What was that? It was the enemy wanting to distract me and get my focus on. And you, you know who helped me snap back to it? As I said to Pastor Doug Spainhauer, which, you know, you know, he could have said, oh, yeah, here, I'll pray for you. I said, hey, pray for me, man. Everything's going all over the place. He said, oh, don't worry about it. God's got this. I'm like, yeah. You know, when you're, when you're in a battle, that sometimes you, you act ignorant. That's not what you want to hear. <laughs> oh, God's got this. I know, I should have thought that it myself. Why am I even struggling? What's the big deal? Who cares? Who cares? Doesn't matter, does it? You don't know that I can't get my stuff to come up. You don't know that I'm having to operate off the notes without slides. You don't know what I'm dealing with. And who cares because we used to not have all that anyway. <sighs> Man. Right? We should just be gliding right through that. But you know what? We don't pay attention. We're not thinking, man, that's just the enemy barking all around me. But Moses, he said, he said Lord, all these people are a bunch of stiff-necked, pain in my back side. God said, I'm just going gonna, gonna to wipe them out. No, 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 Lord, don't do that. He said, okay, Moses, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to send some angels with you when you go out. How many of you would like to have, a, how many of you would like to get up in the morning and, and see a couple big old angels over in the corner of your room, and they're looking at you going, hey, Jeff, we're going with you today, dude. I mean, wouldn't you think that that would be awesome? Did you, have you read the story? Moses looks back at God and goes, no, God, I don't want no stinking angel. These people out here, these wicked people out here, the reason they fear us is because they know our God goes with us. And I'm not moving from this place with no stinking angel. I want you. I'm going to tell you what, we've got the angels are encamped around about us, but I'll tell you something more powerful than that, we have God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit right with us, right here, dwelling inside of us everywhere we are, everywhere we go. He is with me everywhere if we take authority over our situation. Do not follow my example for this morning where I allowed other things to try to bring me into captivity. Follow what I'm saying to you. This morning, the assignment of the enemy that's on you, you do not have to give in to. You can break it off. You do not have to go the way that it's always went or how your family went or how your family did. You can break it off today. Did you hear me? You can take authority over it. 
in the name of Jesus and put it under your feet and say, not for me. I'm going to surrender to the authority and power that Jesus Christ has given to me. You don't need to sit around and wait for Jesus to come and do it. Come on, church. He's given you the power. Oh, Jesus, 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 Jesus. That's what we do. Jesus, 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 Jesus. What are you doing? I'm trying to get Jesus to come. Jesus, 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 come and take authority and power over this demon that's bothering me and beating me and thrashing me and whooping me and stomping me. Jesus, 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 come and help me with this stuff that I've got going on that I've never been able to get a hold of. This inconsistency. No, no, no. Jesus already told us before he ever even left here, I give to you, you, you power. Authority. Put it up underneath your feet yourself. Stand with me today. How many of you this morning, you want to see the assignment of the enemy broken off of your life? Here's the enemy's assignment. John said it in John 10.10, the thief comes not but to kill, to steal, and destroy. He wants to destroy your peace, your life, your joy, your home, your children, your finances, your health. He wants to kill you in any manner he can. You know, it's There's more to dying than just not breathing anymore. A person can be dying and still be alive. He wants to kill you. That's the assignment. I'll tell you what, Jesus has got an assignment. Jesus has got an assignment. He says, I'll tell you what my assignment is for you you have life and you have it more abundant how many of you want to break off the assignment of the enemy on your life this morning and you want to say no enough I don't have to take this he's already given me authority to be well you know what I'm waking up this morning and I'm taking it I'm taking that authority and I'm putting You are notice. You are not going to run me any longer. I'm going to be run by Jesus Christ. The first way to get free from it is to recognize that you're giving in to the assignment that's been placed against you. I believe this morning people are going to come to this altar and we're going to break off the assignment of death and destruction from your life. And we're going to declare life of you, but we're also going to begin to speak in those, all those that the Holy Spirit speaks, we're going to begin to speak about your assignment. your callings and gifts. First and foremost, though, you have to take responsibility for yourself. 
that assignment the enemy has gotten into my life and doesn't have anything to do with Sarita. Oh, well, if Sarita was just a little bit better. If she just a little bit kinder, if she a little bit this, a little bit that. No, no, it's me. How many of you this morning, you would come and you would lift up your hands to Jesus? I want all the elders that can and their wives to come. And you would lift up your hands to Jesus and you would, you would begin to believe with us as I come by, as we come by and we anoint you that, we're, that, that God's going to break off the assignment against you. That God's going to loose you. Don't wait on everybody else. Come on, what about you? Do you know it? Don't worry about what everybody else says or thinks. I want that assignment against me broken.